This episode is brought to you by my friend Rebecca Walser, a financial expert who can help you protect your wealth. Book your free call with her team by going to friendofdinesh.com. That's friendofdinesh.com. Coming up, I want to talk about how the left is pulling out all the stops. Google appears to be manipulating search results to try to help the Democrats in the midterms. I'll examine the claim of Democrats that patriots are intimidating voters by camping out at mail-in drop boxes. I'll reveal how Liz Cheney's plan to scare Republicans away from their own base has failed miserably. Truth Social CEO Devin Nunes joins me. We're going to talk about the Igor Danchenko verdict, the FBI corruption, and the prospects for a GOP majority in November. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Show. this voice. The times are crazy in a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. The uh, Democrats are pulling out all the stops for the midterm election. They're getting a little bit panicky because uh, the polls are showing a movement toward the Republicans, even in areas that Democrats thought were completely safe. So, for example, Washington State, Tiffany Smiley is running against the incumbent Senator Patty Murray. Well, Democrats didn't think they needed to defend Washington State, but suddenly they do. Uh, Tiffany Smiley is running a really strong campaign. And think about it. This would be a very unexpected pickup if Republicans can win a deep blue state, Washington state. And so it looks like the uh, Democrats are calling upon, well, they have the media already largely in their pocket. The media is doing brazen lying and lobbying for Democrats. One very amusing aftermath of the Fetterman debate, and I've been putting out some very uh, sharp tweets about that. Poor Fetterman. I mean, uh, I guess uh, the um, the case for Fetterman can be summarized this way. Yes, I'm, uh, you know, I'm brain dead, but Biden's brain dead too, and he's running the whole country. Why shouldn't I run Pennsylvania? Uh, since when has being brain dead been a disqualification? But what I found laughable was that the Philadelphia Inquirer says, our editorial team watched the debate and we decided that Fetterman won. What? So this is, <laughs> this is, this is literally taking oh, leave of their senses, God. moving into, uh, wow. Crazyville, Twilight USA, zone. just the Twilight Zone, as Debbie puts it. <clears throat> And so it's time to call upon the aid of digital media. And in this case, it's not Zuckerberg so much. Zuckerberg, in fact, had put, as you remember, a giant amount of money, almost half a billion dollars into the 2020 election. He's not doing that in 2022, and I don't think he'll do it in, in 24 either. But Google appears to be doing some um, sneaky backroom stuff. Now, <clears throat> With uh, with Facebook and YouTube, and by the way, Google owns YouTube, the censorship is kind of explicit. You put out a post, they won't show it, uh, or they ban you, and so it's above board. <clears throat> they have these rules and regulations, you can't discuss all these topics. And so there's a little bit of a Sovietization of our digital media. But Google operates kind of in the dark. And I say that because so, you know, Google is because a virtual monopoly on search engines. There are some other search engines, by the way, DuckDuckGo and Bing, but Google is the dominant one. And of course, when you put in a search, <coughs> you kind of assume that the most, um, that the algorithm is going to give you the, the most frequently used results, that there's going to be a sort of a neutral or impartial uh, kind of sorting of the search results. But see, Google gets to fool with that. They get to, you may say, manipulate the dials. And according to the Media Research Center, they're manipulating the dials in the critical key races for Republicans. In other words, <clears throat> the Media Research Center uh, looked at a bunch of key contests. They looked at Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Missouri, Nevada, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Washington State, and Wisconsin. And what did they find? Well, they found basically that <clears throat> when you search the Republican, the Republican candidates, 
you often find that they don't show up in the top searches at all. If you want to find their websites, their information, you've got to scroll lower down, sometimes go to page two or page three. And what this means is that Google is allowing um, uh, media sites or even critical commentary about these candidates to get the top search rankings. Now, when you go to the Democrats, it's the exact opposite. Uh, the moment you put in the Democratic candidate, boom, their website comes up. That's one of the top searches. And so <clears throat> the Media Research Center notices a discrepancy in the, in the way that Republican candidates are treated vis-a-vis -vis Democrats. Now, this is perhaps not a surprise, but it is notice, it is, it is noteworthy that it's going on. It shows you the kind of, quite apart from election fraud, this is the systematic unleveling of the playing field. Republicans are essentially in the position of Sisyphus rolling the stone up the hill. And, and, and then you have all kinds of people trying to push the stone back down. It's a tougher job. Um, now, uh, Google was asked about this and they claim, oh, it's not true. There's no validity whatsoever. We are basically not playing favorites and so on. I don't really believe them. And I, I doubt that you do too. Uh, this is actually not something new for Google. They have been interfering in this way. I'm quite sure that they do it in other areas as well, but it's, it's noteworthy that they are, they seem to be ramping it up ramping it up in the sense that it's become noticeable. It's come on the, uh, it's come to the attention of the Media Research Center right on the eve. We're basically two weeks away from the midterms. <clears throat> I should point out that there are a couple of efforts by, on the part of conservatives to start kind of alternatives to Google. Now, these are being started late in the game and it's not clear where they'll go. Todd Ricketts has launched a alternative to Google called Free Spoke. There's also um, a censorship-free web browser for conservatives called Tusk, T-U-S-K. So all of this, I think, is revealing ways in which long term we have to create our own institutions. In a sense, our own alternative to Facebook. Uh, we have Rumble as an alternative to YouTube. Uh, fortunately, we now have Getter and Truth Social and Devin Nunes will be on uh, later in this podcast to talk about um, uh, to um, uh, to talk about the FBI and the midterms. But I think it is disgraceful that Google, pretending to be a neutral arbiter of speech, is in fact trying to tip the scales for the Democrats. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and I'm excited to announce my original My Slippers are back in stock. You've made them a huge success, and now I've added smaller sizes, larger sizes, wide sizes, and all new colors. And with your promo code, you still save $90 a pair. Not only that, I'm having the biggest closeout sale ever on our sandals and slides for as low as $19.98. What makes my slippers different is my exclusive four layer design that you're not gonna find in any other slippers. My slippers patented layers make them ultra comfortable, extremely durable, and they help reduce stress on your feet. Wear them anytime, anywhere. So go to mypillow.com or call the number on your screen now. Use your promo code to save $90 on my original my slippers or for as low as $19.98, you can get our sandals or slides. Quantities won't last long, and with my 60-day money-back guarantee, you can rest assured they'll be the most comfortable footwear you'll ever own. My new book, uh, 2,000 Mules, is just out, and um, you can get it at Amazon. You can get it at Barnes & Noble. It's, uh, you can also check out 2000mules.com. If you haven't seen the movie, the book and the movie are kind of a great uh, one-two punch and they complement each other. The movie does things that a book can't do, like show your video, and the book does things that the movie can't do, like give uh, lay out the evidence in a systematic form and even a point-by-point -point rebuttal of the critics. I think if you see one and read the other, you'll become a very dangerous American, which will mean that you'll be able to fire back at any of the sort of debunking idiocies that are routinely bandied about by uh, by the left and in the media. Now, one of the um, 2000 Mules effects, you can call it, is there are patriots around the country who've decided to watch drop boxes. And the way they do that is they have like a tailgate party and they show up and they, they just uh, look around and they say, well, you know what, there need to be some eyes on these drop boxes. And that is, by the way, that instinct is completely correct. 
uh, True the Vote issued the statement uh, yesterday, I believe I shared it on social media, that there's nothing illegal in watching a Dropbox. Now, don't interfere in any way with someone who comes to vote, because then the left is going to scream, obstruction, you're, this, is, this is voter suppression. There was one uh, clip on social media. It was very indistinct. I was trying to figure out what's happening. Supposedly, some, quote, grandmother confronted uh, two guys who were armed um, in a, with a van outside a Dropbox. Now, the fact of it is this grandmother refused to show her own face. So you see hear a voice talking. There's a reporter talking to the, the, the grandmother, but the grandmother can't be seen. Uh, and the men themselves don't speak. So you don't know who they are. You don't know what they're doing. Uh, the assumption on the part of the left is, yeah, these are, you know, these are Trump supporters. These are, these are people who have been, um, who have somehow been motivated by 2000 mules. We don't know any of that. What we do know is that is that there should be surveillance on every Dropbox. In fact, if you look at the guidelines issued by CISA, CISA is the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Agency, they say very clearly surveillance on all Dropboxes. Even the Zuckerberg money, when it was given to create these mail-in Dropboxes, has in the contract there should be surveillance on the Dropboxes. And yet, there isn't. There wasn't in 2020. Now there's more surveillance today than there was in 2020. But there are still a lot of drop boxes that don't have 24 hour surveillance. And the question you have to ask yourself is why? Why is that? We live in a time when everything is under surveillance. Streets are under surveillance. Malls are under surveillance. Post offices are under surveillance. Parking lots are under surveillance. So people are accustomed to that. People don't say, well, you know, I'm not going to park my car because it's it's parking lot suppression if somebody's looking at me uh, or if they have a camera on. No, it's not suppression. Uh, it's making sure that if a robbery occurs, they'll know who did it. And similarly, surveillance of the drop boxes, as I say, it's in the rules. There's no excuse not to do it. Uh, in fact, put it differently, the only reason I can think of to not install surveillance is you're trying to create a mechanism where cheating can go undetected. And the Patriots are having none of it. So Mark Elias, the left-wing attorney for the Democrats, has apparently uh, filed some sort of a claim in Arizona against a group. I think it's called Clean Elections or something like that, basically saying, predictably, it's voter suppression. Now, for Mark Elias, pretty much everything is voter suppression. Asking for an ID is voter suppression. And, and one way you can test the validity of these kinds of claims is simply to ask the question, is it suppression in any other context? Is it banking suppression if they ask you for an ID to cash a check? Is it um, medical suppression if you go to a doctor's appointment and they ask you for your ID? Uh, is it travel suppression if an airline demands an ID when you show up to get on the plane? No, it's not. Therefore, it's not voter suppression to ask you to prove that you are who you say you are before you cast a ballot. So all of this, I think, is a way of saying that the movie, the book are producing a good effect. It's a good effect just that so that people know what's going on. People are more vigilant. And this is why the Democrats are nervous. They're nervous because their opportunities are less when our side has its eyes open. The AARP is rallying behind Biden's tax and spend law, promising members it will reduce inflation and bring relief from big pharma. No, in reality, it's going to hurt the 65 plus crowd financially and medically. Now, AMAC knows the truth. AMAC is the Association of Mature American Citizens. It advocates for its members. You'll never find them in anyone's back pocket. I trust AMAC. They're honest. They fight for your conservative values. Join AMAC today like Debbie and I have. AMAC offers special discounts and benefits. Plus, they provide access to financial and insurance counseling services. For only $16 a year, you can join AMAC. Go to AMAC, A-M-A-C dot U-S slash Dinesh to start enjoying benefits. Anyone can join. But if you're a senior, what are you waiting for? Don't let the AARP misrepresent and mislead you. Join AMAC today. AMAC serves its members with integrity and compassion. Join or renew today at amac.us slash Dinesh. That's amac.us slash Dinesh. Where's uh, Joe Biden? Well, <laughs> the answer to that question is in hiding. Uh, this is why Joe Biden 
America is hardly to be seen on the campaign trail, especially in competitive states and competitive races. And you have to put this in context to see how unusual this is. Normally, the president is out there fighting for his side, campaigning aggressively, particularly in the closed states, right before an election. So now you have to ask yourself, why is this not true of Biden? Is it because Biden is really old and really tired? No, that actually has nothing to do with it. Now, when asked about this, Biden goes, well, I've campaigned in 15 races. And of course, the media is like, oh, yeah, you've campaigned in 15 races. Well, Biden's been campaigning only in very safe blue states where people are not horrified to hear the name Biden. Everywhere else, Biden is anathema. Everywhere else, nobody wants to hear his name. Nobody wants to hear about his accomplishments. Everybody just feels a sense of loathing. Um, and it's appropriate because Biden himself is this cranky, angry old man. He lets it show. Who wants to be like some with someone like that? I mean, by and large, when you see that kind of an old guy, you want to cross the street so you don't have to deal with them. That's basically how the American electorate feels towards Biden and probably even Democrats, but certainly independents. The, uh, the New Yorker has an article in which one of their writers is traveling to these swing uh, states and swing districts. And the writer says, I'm noticing that nobody is talking about January 6th. Uh, the, even the Democratic candidates aren't. Nobody's talking about the plot to overthrow democracy. Even the Democrats aren't. Uh, no, but the talking points that dominate DC, that the never Trumpers, oh, we've got to rush to the rescue of Ukraine. We've got to save democracy abroad and at home. Nobody's even mentioning any of this. Why? Because they know that this is a losing strategy in the campaign. In fact, they're downplaying even what Democrats think are their big accomplishments. Oh, yeah, you know what? We we pass bill back better. No one is talking about that in the swing states. Oh, yeah, we got all this money for COVID. We we locked everything down. No, no one's talking about that either. Democrats, apparently, and this is Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire. He also goes uh, and talks to um, Cortez Masto in Nevada. They're all posing as moderates. They're all basically saying, well, we're really all about taking care of our veterans. And we're all really all about trying to lower your prescription drug costs. So Democrats in this view, at least on the campaign trail in the swing states, present themselves as people who are not committed to either side, aren't even very ardent Democrats, certainly aren't progressives or leftists. They never dare use the word left. Uh, they're acting like these are, these are guys who are kind of strong straddling the middle and trying to avoid ideological extremes. Now, the writer of The New Yorker, to his credit, let's look to see who it is, Nick Lemon. Okay, I know Nick Lemon. I've had conversations with Nick Lemon over the years, interviews and so on. When Nick Lemon says, in reality, if you look at Cortez Masto, if you look at uh, Maggie Hassan, they're not moderates. They vote 100% of the time with Pelosi. They vote 100% of the time with Biden. And so what Lemon is getting at, although he's sort of too discreet to say it, is that they are putting on a performance. They are trying to con the independents and the middle of the roaders that they are like them. They're trying to say to people who are feeling great anxiety about the direction in which the Biden left is taking the country, you know, we're not on, we're not on that train either. We're going to help you navigate this kind of middle course where you avoid the ideological extremes. So uh, here is uh, Nick Lemon talking about Cortez Masto, quote, she seldom names the major Biden administration bills that she voted for, the American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Infrastructure and Jobs Act, and so on. She says, I'm not about any of that. She's only about, quote, kitchen table issues. So uh, Lemon goes on to argue that the basic problem the Democrats are dealing with here is that they thought long term they could count on uh, voters of color, which is to say mainly Hispanics, but also blacks, to vote for them in massive numbers. They sort of baked that expectation into their strategy. And now they're realizing that they're not as strong with blacks as they thought, particularly with black males. And they're seeing major erosion and hemorrhaging with the Hispanic vote. All of this bodes very well for us. Uh, Joe Biden can hide all he wants, but I think even his strategy of staying under his desk isn't going to save the Democrats on November 8th. 
You've heard me say it, I'm not a super fan of the flavor of veggies, but I have to admit when I'm in the produce section in the grocery store, all those vibrant colors of fruits and veggies look really good. And Dr. Howard at Balance of Nature explains that all the colors you see in the produce section equal nutritional variety. Different colors signify different key nutrients. So if you're eating only your favorite one or two veggies, you're missing a whole world of vital nutrients. This is why Debbie and I take these six little fruits and veggie capsules every day. Each daily dose is made up of a blend of 31 different fruits and veggies. 31. So variety equals vitality. Give your body everything it needs with Balance of Nature for a limited time. All new preferred customers get an additional 35% discount and free shipping on your first Balance of Nature order. Use discount code AMERICA. Call 800-246-8751, that's 800-246-8751, or go to balanceofnature.com and use discount code AMERICA. I want to talk about the spectacular career failure of Liz Cheney. Now, you might think I'm going to talk about Liz Cheney running for re-election in Wyoming, in a district, by the way, that she dominated, and she was the big name in Wyoming. And there was even talk about her being uh, having Kevin McCarthy's job down the road, that she was a potentially presidential material. And then she starts losing her own base. Republicans around the country begin to be um, uh, suspicious of her, even appalled by her. Her own constituents basically sent her packing, picking a relative nobody, Harriet Hageman, uh, by a decisive margin. So this is all a repudiation of Liz Cheney. But Liz Cheney says, I don't care. I don't care because I have a larger mission. Now, in one sense, her larger mission is I'm trying to prevent Trump from running again. I don't think she's going to succeed in that one. But her larger mission can be stated slightly differently. What Liz Cheney has been the, the front man or the front person um, uh, as part of a left-wing and Democratic campaign to do this, which is what? To separate Republican candidates and Republican elected officials from the Republican base. To put it somewhat differently, the Republican base believes 2,000 mules. The Republican base believes mainstream view that the 2020 election was stolen. And I, and I go to Republican events all the time, Reagan dinners, Lincoln dinners. I'll give a talk about 2000 meals. I won't get a single dissenter. Not one guy comes up and goes, well, what about this? Or you failed to notice that, Dinesh, or I think you're exaggerating. I have essentially unanimous consent. And this is where the Republican base is. But uh, Liz Cheney's idea is what if we use the media, use the Democrats, use social media and browbeat the Republican candidates to run away from their own base. So what they're trying to do is drive a wedge between between the Republican elected officials and would be elected officials on the one hand and the Republican base on the other. And this is where Liz Cheney has totally failed. She's not only failed because all these candidates have come out and they're basically, well, call them 2000 mules candidates, a classic example being Carrie Lake in Arizona. But here's where the failure is even more clear. All the mainstream Republicans who were lionized by the media for keeping some distance from Trump are now campaigning for those candidates, campaigning for the very so-called election deniers that are proclaimed to be that way or labeled that way by the media. So Liz Cheney's real campaign is the campaign to establish that the only good Republican is a bad Republican. Or to put it differently, the only good Republican is a rhino. And the Republican base goes no. And the Republican leadership is now going no. Let's look at it. Senator Tim Scott, Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz have all been in Ohio campaigning for J.D. Vance. Senator Rick Scott uh, and a whole bunch of senators went to Georgia to help Herschel Walker, even after all these so-called revelations about Walker. In what's probably the most unkindest cut of all for the left and for Liz Cheney, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin endorsed Carrie Lake. 
in her battle to become the next governor of Arizona. He's asked, why would you do that? Why would you support an election tonight? She goes, he basically goes, hey, listen, we need more Republican governors. The country is governed better when there are more Republicans in office. Tulsi Gabbard, who ran on the Democratic ticket for president, has endorsed Kerry Lake. She's endorsed Blake Masters. She's even endorsed Don Bolduck in New Hampshire in his campaign against Maggie Hassan. So this is like slap, slap, slap for Liz Cheney and the big campaign about election denialism. Oh, these candidates are radioactive. They're untouchable. Even that some Democrats secretly wish that it'll be Carrie Lake. You know, Carrie Lake is really showing that your secret wish has come true and she's your worst nightmare. So what's going on is the Republican Party is waking up and beginning to recognize that this is what Republicans stand for, this is what Republicans believe, and all the little mach machinations of the media and the fact checkers and, and, and even resolute Liz Cheney pretending to stand on principle uh, are not really quite working out as they had hoped. Are you prepared for the next crisis? Food costs are skyrocketing, industry expert sources are worried about food shortages, as a result of this crisis, survival food is more important than ever. If you don't take action or if you stockpile the wrong foods, you could be setting your family up to go hungry in a time of crisis. Now, 4 Patriots Survival Food Kits, this is the number 4, 4 Patriots Survival Food Kits are a tremendous value. This is not ordinary food. This is delicious, nutritious, good for 25 years super survival food. And customers rave about the delicious flavor. Go to fourpatriots.com slash Dinesh to get your three-month survival food kit, your 273 worth of free gifts and free shipping. Plus, for a limited time, you'll also get $100 off your order. Wow. Go to fourpatriots, the number four, patriots.com slash Dinesh. Grab your three-month survival food kit, all your free gifts and free shipping, and $100 off for a limited time. That's fourpatriots.com slash Dinesh. Guys, I'm delighted to welcome back to the podcast our friend Devin Nunes, uh, who served, well, almost 20 years in Congress at California's 21st and then 22nd Congressional District. He is now the Chief Executive Officer of Trump Media and Technology Group, running the Trump platform known as Truth Social. Uh, Devin, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you as always. Um, Thank you, um, I know that Truth Social had been in a kind of ongoing tussle, maybe is the right word, with Google about making the platform widely available through Google Talk a little bit about where that is, because I saw some news reports, Google has banned Truth Social, and, and that's not true, is it? <laughs> well, finally, Dinesh, this is day 10 of being fully open for every phone in America and the United Kingdom. So it was a long haul, but uh, finally we were approved, we're in the Google Play Store. So, you know, most people either have an iPhone or they have an Android, and they happen to use the Google Play Store. So. Look, we're happy that uh, Google finally approved us, and now it's just important for everyone that knows that's been trying to get on True Social. If you have an Android, we're, we're now open. Oh, this is fantastic. And guys, all of you should be on Truth Social. It's essential that we help build these alternative platforms. We cannot let our fate be reliant on people who really are not are not our friends. Um, I enjoy being on the platform. It's really fun. Uh, I enjoy the engagement on the platform. Of course, Trump is exclusively on the platform. Um, uh, so any other issues that you'd like to talk about with regard to Truth Social before we pivot to talking about the FBI? Well, Dinesh, I would just say that, you know, you've been on there from the very beginning. We're very thankful for that. But also that you actually get a sense to see the difference between a true social where we don't censor, we don't use algorithms, we just use a feed versus the other platforms where a lot of our content creators are pretty much silenced. Even if they didn't get kicked off the other platforms, you get a you get so much more interaction here and so you know we've got basically all of the center right news organizations obviously we're not closed down to center left they just haven't joined they they like to attack true social as being this you know place of misfits and uh, echo chamber and all that kinds of nonsense but the funny thing is is they must have secret accounts on true social because they tend they seem to know an awful lot about true social but you know they're welcome to sign up so far, we've had a few Democrats or former Democrats, but Tulsi Gabbard, former Democrat, she's got a big following on True Social. 
And then, of course, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom from California, he's also on the platform, I think, just to go and interact with President Trump. But, you know, look, we're a we're an open free speech platform. We don't uh, you know, you can come on the platform and you can talk all politics uh, all day long, plus get your news and, and information. I mean, if I look at my own following, uh, let's just compare with Twitter. I'm at 2.4 million. Uh, I was at about 2 million right at the uh, right around the election time. Mysteriously, I dropped to 1.7. I've now crept back up. But on Truth Social, I've just seen a rapid growth, basically from zero to 1.6 million in a much, much shorter period. So that completely confirms and validates what you're saying about the fact that on Twitter, I'm kind of at the mercy of people who are playing with the dials. Uh, you're right. not playing with the dials, and that's a really good thing. That, that's exactly right, and that's a great example. And remember, Dinesh, we've only been fully open in the United States for 10 days. And you're already at 1.6 million. And I think the other thing to remember is, is that, you know, we don't have bots or spam accounts, or at least we don't tolerate them, right? We constantly have people trying to make bots, make spam accounts, where it's the opposite on these other platforms, right? There's, you know, you may think you have, you know, 2 million followers on another platform, but, you know, you really don't. Uh, because either those are ghost accounts or they're corporate accounts or they're bot farm accounts, you know, that were designed back in the day this is how I kind of got interested in this subject back in 2017 and 18 when we were dealing with the Russia hoax is that I noticed on my on my Twitter feed, which I had been on there since you know 2009 or whatever, whenever whenever it opened. And I would notice that I would get attacked and then you start to see a trend, you know, and, and during those days. Right. I was the one that was out there saying, look, the Russia hoax is a hoax. And then I would just get attacked and, and it would give the Aurora kind of the. The, it would kind of you know, send that message to people that, oh, my God, nobody agrees with Devin Nunes and what the Republicans are doing on the House Intelligence Committee because there'd just be attack after attack after attack about, you know, that I'm a Russian agent, that I'm a Putin guy, et cetera. I mean, you've you've seen it all before. And when, in fact, the what all it was, was it was left wing bot farms that were swaying public opinion on these social media platforms. And that's why. I originally, you know, got on Parler when it first opened. I was one of the, I was the first to go on Rumble, which I know you've, you've been on Rumble since the beginning. And, and this is why between True Social and Rumble, we're really creating a separate internet superhighway where people cannot be canceled and they can have their free speech and freedom of expression. That's really the key. It's why I left Congress to create this. And I'm just happy that, that you've been on and, of course, that we're now fully open in the U.S. This is all great news. Uh, let's take a pause. When we come back, we'll talk more with Devin Nunes. What some of us would do just to be young again, the simple things like climbing stairs, getting in and out of bed, taking a walk aren't always that simple. Too many aches and pains, but they can be because thankfully now there's a 100% drug-free solution to aches and pains. It's called Relief Factor. Relief Factor supports your body's fight against inflammation. That's the source of aches and pains. The vast majority of people who try Relief Factor order more because it works for them. Debbie's a true believer. She can finally do the exercises she loves. Planks, push-ups, a stationary bike, all thanks to Relief Factor. It's been a game changer for her and for many people. You too can benefit. Try it for yourself. Order the three-week quick start for the discounted price of only $19.95. Go to relieffactor.com or call 833-690-7246 to find out more. That number again, 833-690-7246 or go to relieffactor.com. Feel the difference. I'm back with um, Devin Nunes, a longtime uh, congressman from California, now chief executive officer of the Trump Media and Technology Group. We've been talking about Truth Social. But Devin, you know, when you were in Congress, you took the lead in exposing the inner workings of the deep state. And we are seeing some of that play out through the Durham uh, indictments and the Durham cases. But Durham so far appears to have a spotty record. Um, most recently, the acquittal of uh, Danchenko, uh, Igor Dan Danchenko on the charge of lying to the FBI. I've advanced the theory, but it's only a theory. I'd like you to comment on it, that part of the reason that the juries have been wary in these cases is because 
Durham doesn't appear to be going after the FBI. In fact, he appears to be saying that these dudes misled the FBI, whereas isn't it a fact that the FBI and the, the deep state were in on this from the outset? Yeah, a- absolutely, Dinesh. And, and I think there's a, there's a larger problem here that Durham is actually exposing. One is that if you are in one of the big, what I call city states in this country, Washington, D.C., Beltway area, New York City, L.A., Bay Area. If you're a Republican and you know this and you know this better than anyone, there's a two tiered justice system. And Durham, I think, is running into that. I believe what Durham was actually trying to do was when he brought up those both Sussman in Washington, D.C. and Danchenko in northern Virginia, what made total sense is he was trying to get them to cooperate and they would not. They lawyered up. They had all the Clinton and DNC related lawyers that represented them. So they were all working behind the scenes together, knowing that when you get into Washington, D.C., good luck. Good luck trying to win a case in D.C. I think Durham had to have known that he was in trouble in D.C., probably thought he had a little bit of a better shot in in northern Virginia, but didn't. So he's now exposed the FBI and he almost had to put them on trial. And I will say this, that, and this is why I have, I have trust in Durham. All my time, 20 years in, in the swamp, I had never saw an investigation that was going on that didn't have massive leaks all over the place, right? And people speculating, clearly people were in the know. This is the rare time where Durham has not leaked. He hasn't spoke to anyone. So all we can do is kind of read the tea leaves. And I think the fact that Durham has not that he he's basically hasn't spoke, hasn't talked, hasn't leaked, you see that he's having to put the FBI on trial. That can only be for one reason, that he has not been able to bring criminal conspiracy against these bad actors. It's not just the FBI, it's at DOJ, other intelligence agencies, and also within the DNC and the Clinton campaign. And even, I would say, the Mueller team during that Mueller investigation. So He's exposed a lot. Why he's not bringing criminal conspiracy, we don't know. We made 14 criminal referrals from from our end in in Congress. I think that's the challenge that Durham Durham is having right now. And no one knows where he's going to go from here. And I would say that if Republicans have a good day in two weeks, uh, I think that will at least give Durham more of a lifeline to continue. And I would say that I, I think it's really important for the future of this country for Durham to continue this investigation, uh, even if the Biden administration won't let him bring charges. And I think that's the key. He's got to have a sign off from Garland in order to bring these charges. That's very interesting because there had been some speculation, which I echoed, that that perhaps Durham was trying to catch some of the small fry and let the big guys go uh, free. Um, but what you seem to be saying is that you think Durham is on the up and up. Durham is trying to go after the bad guys. Obviously, he needs the co- the cooperation of the lower level crooks to catch the higher level crooks. Where does he go from here? What's his next step? Look, I mean, the rumor is, but it's only rumor. He was, you know, he was supposed he's supposed to be writing a report. Um, everybody in the fake news are speculating. Well, Durham's done. He's just writing a report. We don't know that right now. And I think Durham's just going to continue to investigate. Obviously, if Republicans do well, I think that gives them a little bit of a a lifeline because it's not, you know, they can't just get rid of him. So, you know, we don't know where he goes, but, um, you know, it will also be interesting because if this report is written um, and if that is all he does, is that report going to come out? And that's why it's going to be important. I think if Republicans do gain control of, of Washington, uh, of Congress, they're going to have to put in a 9-11 style commission uh, or a church commission that was created back in the 1970s to fix this whole problem with the DOJ and the FBI and the Democrats and the left in this country. And don't forget, that includes the fake news who was in on this Russia hoax from the very beginning and the big tech companies who were also in on this hoax, right? Which is, you know, and, and all of this stuff is intertwined, right? From the Russia hoax accusing Trump, to then the Ukraine impeachment hoax, that then we learn, no, it was actually Hunter Biden. Then they cover up the Hunter Biden laptop for the 2020 election. All of this stuff is related. 
And I think the Republicans are only going to be able to get to the bottom of this if it's a large style commission that has congressional power, that has subpoena power, that can rip apart this incestuous relationship that we now know is there, whether it's Fauci coordinating with the tech companies or the FBI working with the tech companies and the fake news. It's all there in plain sight. And the Republicans owe it to the American people to put something in place that gets to the bottom of this that would basically be if you take Durham, he's from the executive branch. We need something similar on the legislative branch. You were in there, you know these guys, you know the Republican leadership, and yet you're not in there now so you can speak freely. They should do these things, but will they? Look, the question will be, I mean, I think a guy like Jim Jordan, who I know well, who I worked with closely, you know, he has so much on his plate um, that he's going to have to get to the bottom of as if he becomes chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Um, I just don't think there's going to be any other way they're going to be able to get to the bottom of this. Because one thing we learned is that the, the FBI and DOJ have a real convenient place to hide within the, the within the seams. So they would come to us continually and why it took us so long to get to the bottom of this, although it was only a year, by the way, it only took us, you know, we actually released that the Nunes memo back in early 18, if you can believe it's been that long ago. But they were very convenient, Dinesh. They would say, oh, if you guys expose this, people are going to die. Really important sources are going to die. Oh, and then we find out, oh, it was... Danchenko, a guy who had born born in Russia, but was a long-term Democratic operative and had Democratic connections, or, oh, it was Dolan, some Clinton operative, right, that was out there. Those were the people that were going to die. I mean, it was just preposterous. And then they would also then bring these guys on as confidential human sources because they say, well, Congress, the legislative branch, doesn't have a right to know who we're paying as confidential human sources. And this is also relevant. Remember, I made the tie to the big tech and Hunter Biden laptop. We can also make the connection to January 6th, where same people, same Gestapo, FBI, and, and the people in the DOJ, same people that work for Obama now work for Biden. All of these people are connected. And guess what? What do they do? We've got people running around in this country that were at January 6th, clearly inciting violence. And they've not been arrested, yet they're out there in the open. The only thing one can suspect is they've used conveniently this confidential human source to hide. So it's they'll, they'll claim ongoing investigation. Oh, you're going to outsource this in order to hide things from Congress. And that's why you know, my old friends in Congress have got to put together almost this 9-11 style commission that has great powers or they're not going to get to the bottom of it, Dinesh. So look. All those, all the folks in there that I worked with. I mean, these are these are they're, they're fighters. They have spirit. I mean, they wouldn't be running for office if they didn't. But it's one thing to have the you know to have the willingness to fight. It's another thing to know how to fight what is really you know the the deep state working with the radical left to take over the intelligence agencies and justice system in this country. I mean, it seems to me to be an absolute imperative. Uh, great stuff. Thank you, Devin Nunes, for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dinesh. Always a pleasure to be with you. We're in book 16 of the Odyssey, which begins with a really joyful reunion of Odysseus with his son, Telemachus. At first, Telemachus doesn't recognize his father, uh, in part because Athena has disguised Odysseus. Odysseus kind of feels out Telemachus uh, but then he reveals himself. He goes, I'm your dad. I'm Odysseus. Um, they embrace. And what's important here is that Telemachus can give Odysseus some very specific information of what he's up against. <clears throat> Telemachus says, now talking about the palace and about his household, we cannot fight the two of us against such strong men and so many. There are dozens, not just a handful 52 come from Dulcicium, all top-notch fighters who brought six henchmen, 24 men came from Same, 20 more from Zancinthus, and from right here on Ithaca came 12. So you kind of run the numbers here and you can see that you're talking about over 100 young, strong men, basically warrior types, and they are all in Odysseus's home. Now, <clears throat> Odysseus has been thinking about this. He, remember, he's known about the problem 
um, since he went to the underworld. And after that, he was seven years on Calypso's Island. He's had time to formulate at least something of a plan. And here he reveals his plan. He basically tells uh, his son that he, Odysseus, will be dressed up as a beggar in rags with his face disguised. The swineherd will take him into town, will escort him. And, uh, and Odysseus tells the swineherd, Eumaeus, who, by the way, also obviously now knows who Odysseus is, he says, um, you will see people on the street look down on me, maybe make comments about me, maybe even throw things at me. He goes, do not intervene. Do not blow my cover is what he's saying. He goes, you must restrain yourself, repress your feelings, even if they grab me by the foot, kind of making making fun of him. He goes, uh, politely tell them they should stop this folly. They will ignore you. So Odysseus actually, he's in his own country. He actually knows that there is a social hierarchy, that it may be that he will be given bad treatment if he <clears throat> masquerades as a beggar. But he says uh, he's going to make his way to the palace to ask for alms, to, to ask for food, to ask for assistance. And then he tells Telemachus, this is what you, Telemachus, need to do. Uh, you need to find all the weapons that are in the house, weapons all over the place, as it turns out, that are used for fighting. He says, quote, go and hide them away inside the upstairs storage room. So <clears throat> collect the weapons, put them away. Why? So the weapons are no longer accessible to the suitors. And when the suitors ask where they have gone, he says, uh, uh, tell them they were near the fire. So I removed them from the breath of smoke since they were getting damaged. They were losing their sharpness and their luster. And then he says, um, I also am removing them because very often you suitors, you eat too much, you get drunk, you start fighting with each other, you come to blows. This is a little bit risky because it says that you might then grab a weapon and hurt each other and then your um, your your uh, <clears throat> dinners and your courtship will be ruined. And so uh, Odysseus says, get rid of the weapons, but not all of them. Uh, leave out two swords, two spears and two thick shields for you and me to grab before we rush. So in other words, Odysseus needs to be armed. Telemachus needs to be armed. So they each need, they need swords, they need spears, and they need shields. So Odysseus essentially says, leave enough for you and me, put everything else away. <clears throat> Laertes and the swineherd must not know. <clears throat> so Odysseus is divulging his plan to uh, Telemachus, but don't tell Eumaeus. This is Odysseus taking every step to make sure nothing goes wrong here. Nor any of the slave girls, not even Penelope. So here's Odysseus. He knows, he probably suspects that some of the slave girls have attached themselves to the suitors. So telling them is to risk the whole scheme being revealed. But the remarkable thing is, don't even trust Penelope. So you have here the assumption running, by the way, through the Iliad and the Odyssey, that w not that women are never to be trusted, but that women are never to be trusted until they prove themselves trustworthy. Um, now, Odysseus does trust Penelope, but he's been away for 20 years, 10 years in the war, 10 years making his way home. It's almost like he has to sort of reconfirm her fidelity and her trustworthiness. So until he knows that, his point is, it's sort of you and me, Telemachus, against everybody else. And so this is Odysseus's plan to have the weapons at the ready, to show up as a beggar at the right moment, to grab the weapons, and he and Telemachus together will attack and, um, as his plan goes, kill all the suitors so they can be put out of the way and he can resume um, his uh, lawful authority over his uh, palace, but also over his land of Ithaca. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.